Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring remote viewing and nautical archaeology. We'll be looking in particular at the recovery of the wreckage of a 19th century American brig known as the Leander. My guest is Stefan Schwartz, who is the author of The Secret Vaults of Time, Psychic Archaeology and the Quest for Man's Beginnings. His other books include The Alexandria Project, Opening to the Infinite, The Eight Laws of Change, How to Be an Agent of Personal and Social Transformation, as well as novels, The Vision, a novel of time and consciousness, and Awakening, a novel of aliens and consciousness, and to be published shortly, The Amish Girl, a novel of psychic criminology and consciousness based on a real case study. Once again, this is an internet interview. I hope it will be, you'll find it of higher quality than previous ones. I'm really working hard to increase the technical quality of interviews on the internet, and now I'll switch over to that video. Welcome, Stefan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. And uh, once again, we're going to talk about some of the, what I regard as very important work that you've been doing in the field of nautical archaeology. We did a, an earlier uh, interview about uh, the exploration you did uh, off the coast of Jamaica, looking for w one of the original uh, caravel ships of Christopher Columbus. Now we're going to look at a project that took place in the Bahamas. Yes. And Welcome. Uh, I'd to talk to you again. <laughs> yeah, it's great to be with you, Stefan. Uh, this is a project I understand that you did in coordination with the Bahamian government. They actually gave you exclusive permission to uh, begin a, an archaeological uh, excavation or search uh, in, a, in a particular, very clearly defined area. Yes. Uh, well, I actually had to get the Bahamian government to change the law in order to do it. But they, they gave us a, the, the permission to do a survey of the Grand Bahama Banks, which had not been previously done. So we had the Bahamian government involved, and then we had Nova University involved, and Peter Throckmorton, who was one of the founders of marine archaeology, uh, was the lead archaeologist uh, working for us on that. So we had uh, Nova University, and then we had graduate students from several other universities who came out and participated um, in this survey of the Grand Bahama Banks. And we also had researchers in uh, the major um, nautical archives in the United States, England, and in Spain, also searching to see if there was any prior evidence of, of any of the ships that we found, the, uh, this particular project that we're going to talk about is an American brig. Uh, we f were able to identify it at the end by as the uh, Leander. And um, the Leander was uh, an American brig that apparently, based on Throckmorton's analysis, um, was caught in a storm, it's the, you know, the hurricanes down there, and went into the lee of this, this little, um, it's not really even a, hardly an island, it's more like a ridge, but it, it allowed them to get in the lee of the worst of the wind and storm, and then something happened and they apparently sank. We don't know why. And so, working with remote viewers, you were able to, uh, identify the location, and actually uh, recover some objects. Yes, we we did a survey, you know, that as we've discussed before, we did a survey of the entire search area, which was uh, 
579 square miles, and um, we located a number of ships. This was just the most important one uh, in that particular area. And, um, and of course, as usual, I ran a parallel operation um, with uh, independent uh, specialists who did an electronic survey of the same area and to see whether you could locate using traditional electronic remote sensing the same site that the remote viewers were able to locate. And as is, was the case in this instance and in all prior cases as well, by the way, and subsequent, uh, you were not able to locate it using electronic remote sensing. Only remote viewing uh, made the location possible. In reading your paper, uh, I was left with the impression that the area that you searched, I think you identify it as something like search area C, the 569 square mile area, which is pretty large. Uh, th that is actually a... Uh, a subsection of the uh, Grand Bahama Banks. Uh, well, search area C was an area of 11.81 square miles out oh. of uh, an area of 500, almost 579 square miles. Now, you, you have to think of this, Jeff. Um, th you can't go very far in. It gets very shallow. You know, the the Grand Bahama Banks is a uh, limestone. Basically, if you saw it on the land, you'd think of it as a kind of a massif or a cliff. Um, I mean, the, the 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 depth of the water goes from oh anywhere from thirteen to twenty five feet down to about uh, between twelve hundred and seventeen hundred feet. So, if you were looking at it, you know, if you were driving in a car and you were looking at this. It would be like this enormous massif that, um, uh, and uh, that you'd be looking up at if you were in the car and you were down at the depth of it. And of course, the, the, the Gulf Stream runs up this channel next to this cliff. And so you have this, um, large world ocean stream, uh, ocean current, and then it hits this kind of wall, uh, which then becomes quite shallow. And so the search area that we're looking at is long, but not very wide, because uh, it gets down to, oh, 10, 9, 8, 7 feet. Uh, so ships can't get in there, so that we weren't searching that. What we were searching was the area where a ship could still operate now, it's, it is true that in some cases, uh, ships would hit this area and uh, would hit a shallow spot and the top of the ship would break off. It had to do with the way wooden ships were manufactured and, um, and the top would keep going further in, in, not inland, but further into this zone. But we were searching this long, relatively narrow, just a, a couple of miles, few miles. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's quite extensive. Mm. Um, and then, in accordance, just as we described in our discussion on the Caravel project, I ask a, a series of viewers to, I give them a map that um, has all the colors and the names taken off, and I asked them to locate, in this case, the task was, please locate any shipwrecks that you see um, in this area. And I had researchers in, in um, uh, uh, Spain and in Maine and in uh, England who were searching nautical archives to see if we could identify some of the ships that they located why we were able to identify them. But because we were testing the ability of remote viewing, we were particularly interested in ships that the remote viewers located that were not previously known to exist. I mean, the ships were known to exist, but what happened to them was not known. 
and their location was unknown. So there's a large number of ships that run into the Bahama Banks and, and bad things happen to them. In this case, this particular wreck, this Brig Leander, uh, was a known ship. Obviously, that's how we know its name. But what happened to it was never had never been known. So it was simply listed as a missing ship, as was quite common in the days of sail, where ships would just go down for one reason or another, and, and nobody ever knew what happened. Now, as I recall from your, your paper, the historical researchers uncovered record, records of some 300 ships that had sunk in that general area. Yeah, that, that's correct. In, this, in the general search area, the whole search area we had, there was about 300 ships that we were able to identify. Um, I mean, this was part of the, the survey. We, we published, uh, Peter Throckmorton and I published a survey of the um, Grand Bahama Banks listing all of these ships. It was the first time it had ever been done. And then from the remote viewing point of view, we were particularly interested in the location of, of wrecks that um, were unknown and could not be identified and as to their location, but for which we could get historical documentation as to what kind of ship they were and, and uh, so that we had stuff, we had um, documented information by, with which to compare the uh, remote viewing uh, to do the concept by concept analysis. And mm -hmm. so th this, the, the Brig Leander, um, we were able to locate, to get a description of the ship, not where it, what happened to it, but we had, there were records of it that came, it was an American brig, uh, and it came out of, uh, the northeastern United States. So, uh, we had some comparative material that we could, we could look at. The, the interesting thing, as I said, is that, uh, we do a parallel survey of the whole thing using, uh, in this case, side scan sonar and uh, proton precession uh, magnetometers. And um, you would not have been able to locate this, this Brig Leander using electronic remote sensing. And also when we went to the place where the remote viewers led us, there was nothing to see. The ship was, as described by the viewers, was between three and four feet under the sand. So even if you had been diving, and I'm, that's not impossible that people had, uh, been diving in that area, there was nothing to see, so you never would have found it. So the point from the point of view of remote viewing was that there was no other way to find this ship but remote viewing. And I gather that this ship was located in what you've identified as search area C. Yes, so the way the process works is I give them a map that that's just black and white or, or that I run through a blueprint maker. And because we know from research that people get drawn to particular colors for a variety of reasons, so you just eliminate the colors. And what we're looking for is a, pl is a target area where more than one remote viewer selects that site that produces what we call a consensus zone. And the Brig Leander, in fact, was in a consensus zone that was 11.81 square kilometers, uh, square miles, excuse me, um, 30.59 square kilometers. Um, because no map, a map would have to be as big as the actual area so when someone makes a little circle, even though they make as small and tight a circle as they can, why, in terms of the actual geographical area, it still covers a large area, in this case, just under 12 square miles. And then the next step is to take people out in a boat and give them a buoy, as I did with Hella Hammond and Alan Vaughn, and you give them a buoy one at a time, and they, you take them out and you say, now we're on the edge of the consensus zone that you have previously selected. So would you please direct us now to exactly the location where the ship is to be found? And when they get over that place, well, then they drop their buoy and we take a GPS fix 
so that we can get back. Cause it's hard to get back to the ocean in places in the ocean. We pull the buoy up so that there's nothing to reveal where the first buoy was dropped. We go back, we let the first viewer off, we put the next viewer on, we do the same thing. We take them out to the edge of the consensus zone. We say, this is the edge of the consensus zone. Would you please locate the exact location? And they, you give them a buoy, and then we go out. They direct us, go left, go right. And when they get to where they think the buoy is, or where they think the location is, they drop their buoy. And we take a second uh, GOP, GPS fix, and um, and in this case, the, uh, which is not unusual, the two locations were uh, within about, I don't know, 10 feet of each other. So you then, um, we did a survey, electronic survey, nothing turned up. So then we went over to the, to be right over the ship and we began an excavation process where we remove uh, from the edge of the ship so that we don't go directly down into it at first. We we remove the sand until we get down to see if there are any ship remains. And in fact, of course, I, there were. Well, did you pay any attention to the mental process of your remote viewers uh, while they're in the ship with you trying to tell you how they know they're, that you're right on top of the uh, target that you want to identify? Well, you know, th th there isn't a single answer to that, Jeff. Um, Hella Hammond, for instance, felt when she was doing the map work, she looked for places there where she felt warmth. Uh, Alan Vaughn used uh, a pendulum and did a kind of dowsing. It's a, in fact, the initial stage of this, the map work, is a form of dowsing. Yeah. And Alan would take it. He had a little pendulum that he liked, and he would take the pendulum out and do it. Um, th there were uh, a number of viewers that took part in this. Uh, Michael Crichton, for instance, the film director and writer, the, uh, the late Michael Crichton. Uh, Michael was a particular, he was a very good remote viewer, and he he felt a kind of heaviness. So different people report different things, and then when you put them in the boat and you take them out, you know, again, they, they have their own um, idiosyncratic, I guess would be the right word, their own sort of idiosyncratic physical sensations about what it is, they, again, um, Hella just feels, she felt she was just being pulled to it, and um, Alan felt similarly, that he, he directed us to go up to it, and he just felt a kind of weightiness, and so he, when he dropped it, then he dropped his buoy. So the physiological, the, the sensorial uh, sensations, I guess, differ from person to person, but the, the, each of them has trained themselves to be sensitive to these usually relatively nuanced impressions and to, um, and to respond to them. The key to it, of course, as I, you know, you and I have discussed before, is the ability to attain and sustain intention-focused awareness. I mean, that's the key to the whole thing. It takes many different forms. People respond differently. You know, in the early days of parapsychology, they used to talk about clairaudience and clair, clairvoyance, and some people would hear things, some people would feel things, some people would see things. It's as if they were different phenomena, but it's not. It's just that individual organisms respond to things in different, with different sensitivities. Maybe that's the way way to say it. You know, some people smell more acutely than other people. They some people have a finer sense of hearing than other people. So I never could identify anything that was that you could generalize. It was just about that specific person.
So there you are in the middle of the uh, sea, and and you've taken two remote viewers out independently of each other to drop a buoy, and somehow they manage to come within ten feet of each other. That alone is quite remarkable. Oh, I, you know, I have witnessed this now for fifty years. I've been watching people do things like this. George locating the buried building in the in the city of the buried city of Maria, um, mm -hmm. Andre Viacourt at the at the in the uh, Caravel project, uh, Talking Idol of Victual project. It, it's astonishing to watch this happen because it really, uh, first of all, uh, this is important actually. First of all, as it's happening, it seems very normal. There's nothing, it's not supernatural, it's not woo-woo, there are, you know, no seraphim appear, it's not, there's nothing macabre about it or occult about it, it's like going out, if I, you and I went out and you said to me, uh, Stephen, do you, uh, do you hear that dog barking over there? It's just as casual as that. They don't make a big fuss about it. Um, they don't, um, they're not in trance states. No one's speaking through them. It's none of the stuff that you see in the movies or in television shows about things like that. It's not spirits and all of that sort of stuff. It's, it's, at the time that it is happening, it seems very ordinary. It's only when you actually dig up the stuff or you dive on the stuff, whatever, and you find these extremely detailed descriptions that they've given you are in fact absolutely correct. That it's just kind of mind boggling. You know, in the case of Maria, the, the, the buried city, the buried building in the buried city in Egypt, they were, Hella and George located these, these little tiles that were five eighths of an inch across and they described them as being red, black and white and having a, a white chalky substance on one side of them, which turned out to be the plaster under the, the way they set the tiles. Um, but five eighths of an inch, right? So you're looking at, I think it was 1,700 square miles. And out of that, you're getting down to something you could put in your pants pocket. I mean, it's just really amazing if you think about it. In this case, the in the Brig-Leander case, what really stood out for me, of, of, I mean, of many things, but, but particularly the description of these little medicine bottles. They, they describe that in part of the ship, where the ship's doctor would have been, um, there, wa there was a box that was decayed and g gone away, but that we would find these little, little tiny glass bottles about, oh, maybe an inch and a half long, little hand-blown bottles that still contained, they were still sealed because they had wax on the end, they were still sealed uh, and contained medicines that... Um, uh, would at, at the time when the ship was in, in, of one piece and still functioning, would have been in the doctor's medicine chest. So to listen to somebody from Los Angeles or from Rome, and one of the viewers was in Rome or one of them was in Canada, some of them were back east in the United States, uh, one was in Mexico, to listen to people who are looking at a blueprint size map of a large area that none of them had ever been to. I mean, there's nothing to go to. It's out in the middle of the ocean. Describe for you not only the location of the ship, but these little tiny things that you will find. They described we would find these pewter, a kind of pewter cups. And in fact, we found them. And so they you know, you're listening to people describe these little tiny things and what they were used for that you're going to find, and then you go thousands of miles away to this middle-of-nowhere place, 
and you dig exactly where they tell you and you find these tiny little objects, it's it's extraordinary. I mean, I've, I've been watching it for decades now and I have never stopped being amazed at the level of detail that you can get. So you actually had divers go down and dig into the sand and at a depth of some three to four feet, there are these vials. The first thing we found when we took the layer of sand off the top, Michael Crichton had said to us, the first thing you'll see are these big railroad tie shaped uh, beams of wood. And he said they look like railroad ties. They're parallel to one another. And they're kind of laid out. To him, they look like railroad ties. And so I couldn't figure out what that meant or what that was. Or, But as we took off the, the top layer of the sand, got down to where this ship was located, by God, the first thing we saw were these railroad ties, they look exactly like railroad ties that you'd see on a, you know, on a train track. Um, these sort of, how to describe them? Beams of wood, hand-hewn wood, uh, lined up parallel exactly as he saw them. And then as we went down, we went down not on top of the ship, but we moved out and went down sort of, um, if you can think of the, if you can imagine the ship being a ship, um, then we went down sort of the side of it, because that allowed us to see the various layers, what had once been the decks of the ship, they had all collapsed, but we could, we could then get a side profile of the ship, and could see what kind of construction it had, and for the, for the, um, uh, archaeologists, we had a team of archaeologists, uh, Peter was the, the head of it, uh, we had a, a group of archaeologists, and so yes, the way this works is first you do the location part, and then you move in with um, equipment that will remove the sand, so I had 25 divers, I mean, it's a big operation, it was, it was all being run off the sea view, which was the research vessel that I acquired, a 110-foot research vessel that was set up to do marine archaeological uh, research and recovery. We had a, you know, we were also sent down a little uh, remote-operated vehicle to see what we could see, first of all, and then we put divers in the water, and they couldn't see anything even when they got right on top of it. And um, and then as we staked it out, the exact area that the viewers had outlined, with um, you know with stakes and yellow uh, n nylon line, and then that's what we began to excavate, and um, uh, and you can see it as they described it, um, one by one, all of these things that they had described appeared. So, so the viewers were able to identify the outline of the uh, wreckage of the ship pretty precisely. Uh, I presume you weren't able to do that with any kind of technological uh, equipment. That is correct. No, you would not have found this ship using any kind of an electronic or traditional remote sensing technology. And the reason, I think, was, was because the ones that rely on there being ferrous metal, um, there wasn't enough ferrous metal to set it off. And the um, side scan sonar, because of the structure of the rock and the sand, uh, nothing showed up. And so the only thing we could, we could use was the remote viewing guidance. That's mm -hmm. why... I considered the project important. I mean, we found a number of other ships and did work on them. And, and it, in the overall report that, that Peter Throckmorton and I did on the, on the Grand Bahama Banks, we cite all kinds of ships. But this is, ship is important because 
it couldn't have been found any other way, and because of the extreme detailed observations that the remote viewers made um, that were later validated by on-site excavation, and then subsequent to that, the concept-by-concept concept assessment of every concept. So we've discussed this before, but, you know, if I were saying, for instance, uh, the man sitting in front of me with a brown tweed jacket, that's only one sentence, but it's man sitting uh, in front of a brown tweed jacket. So there's like seven or eight concepts in there. And the way this works is after you do the excavation, then you have experts of various kinds come in and evaluate every one of those concepts. And, and this is important because not only does it give you a level of accuracy that you don't see in any other kind of remote viewing work, there is, so far as I know anyway, there is no other body of, of remote viewing research that gets to this level of specificity. You know, the, the stuff that was done for classified reasons for the intelligence community, they, they never gave the kind of detailed concept-by-concept concept analysis and the criminological work that we did, for instance, we couldn't get it either because the people that were asking us to do it, they just don't have the time or don't want to take the time or, you know, they got so much other going on in their lives that spending the dozens or hundreds of hours of rating each concept because it requires research, uh, they just don't like to do it. So un unless you do it the way we did with the Mobius Consensus Protocol, where you, you bring in teams of people from different disciplines, different universities, and get them to do the assessment, uh, and, and you pay for it, uh, you just can't get it. So there's, there, there's no other body of remote viewing work of which I am aware that has this level of detail. And the reason this detail is important is not just because of the accuracy, I mean, that's important, obviously, but also because it tells you things about how non-local consciousness works. This is how I got, um, it was doing this kind of work that led me to understand about numinosity and entropy, which we've discussed. You know, mm -hmm. the, the idea that things which are, have been the focus of intention-focused awareness, particularly in a heightened emotional sense, that things that are that like that are easier to see for remote viewers than things which don't get much observation, or if they do get observed, nobody pays much attention. So when you when you work at this level of detail, you're able to extract information about how the process of remote viewing works. But my interest from the beginning, I've never been interested in the question of is this stuff real because by the time I got into research I, 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 there was no question in my mind that it was real. There was 50 years of research. I wrote The Secret Vaults of Time of to cover all the archaeological work done prior to my becoming involved. Um, the reason I picked archaeology was because it would offer these kind of this kind of detail which is it was triple blind by definition and it offered very meticulous details, which I understood from the beginning was going to help us understand how this all worked. So my questions were not, is it real, but how does it work, and what is it telling us about the nature of our consciousness? And, and a project like, like the Brig-Leander project um, in the Bahamas was... a uh, a teaching moment because it 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 showed me that first of all that different people different viewers that's why one of the reasons I use multiple viewers I started using multiple viewers because I had been an investigative reporter for newspapers at one point in my life and the way you do investigations like that is you get multiple sources and you ask them, and not all of them will tell you the truth, not all of them are right, not all of them saw everything or understood what they were seeing. I mean, there's lots of variation. But when you 
put the, all, the whole package together, you can pretty well dis, in, reconstruct what happened. And the intelligence community does the same thing. Police do the same thing. So I was looking at if I used if I use men viewers and women viewers, do I get different kinds of answers? If I use viewers that have graduate education as opposed to viewers who have elementary school education, do I get different things? And and by doing these kinds of experiments, I was able to tease out answers to that. For, just to give you an example, in another project, I had a group of viewers. They were viewing a particular person who had who uh, all of the viewers said there's something mentally wrong with this guy and he takes some kind of medication that affects his blood but Judith Orloff who's a, phys a psychiatrist and Michael Crichton who was a physician didn't practice but was trained as a physician both of them said oh oh this guy takes he has some mental disorder and uh, they they deal with it by giving him a neuroleptic drug Whereas George McMullen, who had an eighth grade education, was a parts manager at a Chrysler dealership in Nanaimo, Canada, he said, there's something screwy about this guy's blood, and they give him some sort of drug that smooths him out. <laughs> and so you see the, what that taught me was that the skill sets that people have in their normal waking life carry over to their remote viewing. For instance, Hella Hammond was a fine arts photographer and um, did beautiful compositions. I mean, if you look at Hella's photography, what really stands out about it is her composition and how she catches a, a big prominent uh, geometric form and, 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 and builds her picture around that, for instance. And just in the same way, um, Hella uh, was able to describe in, for instance, the Deep Quest experiment, the big stone block, which nobody expected, or in the Maria project, she was able to describe the um, this strange pillar that had been built subsequently. So George McMullen, in contrast, very strongly emotionally identified with uh, what he called First Nation people, Native American people, we would say in the States. And so he was very sensitive to their rituals and beliefs in a way that um, Jack Houck, who was an aeronautical engineer and worked in se secret work involving satellites, what he was interested in is how the electrical circuitry and uh, was hooked up and could describe that. So it was doing these kinds of experiments that taught me that the skill sets that people develop in their normal waking lives uh, carry over into the altered states of consciousness that, that are the, a function of remote viewing. Now, I gather that uh, overall, when you, you take all of these details provided by all of these viewers, uh, to the extent that you were able to evaluate them, they were about 80% accurate. Yes, we expect it. The breakdown of the concept analysis showed us this is another reason for doing this kind of meticulous uh, uh, assessment. We expected over many, many experiments, um, I realized in doing an analysis and then doing a meta-analysis of all of them, that between 35 and 40 percent of the material that was provided by remote viewers could not be evaluated. Now, that doesn't mean it was wrong. It just meant that you couldn't evaluate it, what somebody was thinking or the clothes they were wearing that are now decayed and gone. Um, so between 35 and 40 percent, you just couldn't say one way or another. You just couldn't evaluate it. Of the part that you could evaluate, of the, of the anywhere from uh, 30 to 40 percent that you could have, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the 50 to 60 percent that you could do, um, we expect to see 75 to 85% of it be 
uh, judged correct or partially correct but operationally useful. That would be, to use the earlier example, if I said uh, the man in uh, uh, gray-brown uh, jacket, um, that might be partially correct, but it would still be operational. And so, um, or if I said the man with the, the green uh, disc in his lapel, well, I, your disc has got more than green in it. So that would be, uh, we w because we get down to that level of fineness, that yeah. would be considered partially correct, but operational because there is, in fact, uh, a metallic disc with the green color in your lapel, right? So well, we expect... Make... So, go ahead. Doesn't it make sense then that uh, with regard to the 30 to 40 percent of information that you cannot evaluate, that you might nevertheless assign a, a probability that uh, maybe it's 80 percent accurate, even if you don't know for sure? Well, yes. I mean, you could say you could extrapolate and say if it's 75 to 85 percent correct, um, uh, or partially correct but operational, um, that the same is probably true of the unevaluatable source. But I am extremely conservative in these assessments. And so while I think you could probably say that, and it would probably be accurate, um, I can't say it because I can't evaluate it. But I should imagine you must have been curious, for example, as to how this ship went down and that probably your remote viewers gave you some indications. They did. And not only did they give it to us, the, but it was validated by the archaeologists. They described this ship as, as getting behind this, getting in, on the lee side of, of this um, limestone outcropping uh, in order to get out of a storm, and that um, uh, something had happened that they, uh, I couldn't evaluate it, but um, when I talked to, uh, uh, when I asked uh, uh, Peter and the other archaeologists, you know, is does this description of what happened sound plausible? They said, yes, we know, for instance, that it didn't explode because the parts were still all together. They were decayed, but they were together. Whereas, as, as for instance, as Throckmorton said, if this had been a ship in which uh, the powder hold, for instance, for the cannon, had blown up, um, then you would have seen a very different distribution of, of debris than you see in this case. If the ship had burnt down, for instance, you know, these are wooden ships with tar coating the parts of them in order to keep them waterproof, so they're very flammable. That f fire was the thing they feared more than anything. He said if the ship had caught fire and burnt down to the, you know, just burnt down to the water line, then you, we would be seeing wood that had uh, a, a fire char on it. But we don't. So, therefore, the description that they, that the remote viewers gave of the ship went in behind this limestone ridge and uh, to get out of the storm, which, in fact, on the sea view, the ship, that my research vessel, we did the same thing. I mean, it's what all, all ships, you know, unless you're a huge, I don't know, an aircraft carrier or something, you pull in, you get on the lee side of something that'll break the sea, and and uh, uh, break the wind up a little bit, and and uh, because you're safer, uh, so apparently that's what the remote viewers said had happened, and it was Throckmorton's judgment that in fact that was exactly what they had done, because of the way of the disposition of the remains of the ship. And, and so this evaluation of the accuracy item by item, it's not something you did. It's something done by independent judges. Oh, yes. This is very important. I don't do the accuracy assessment. I get people who are um, uh, independent experts. And, and it's not one person either. That's another thing. There is no such thing 
as omni scientists. You know the the um, the uh, assumption is that um, that if you are a specialist in one area of archaeology, you're a specialist in all areas. But I learned very quickly many years ago that's not true any more than if you're a biologist, you're a specialist in all areas of biology. So what you have to do is put teams of people together who will do these assessments. So you get some people that specialize in ship forms, you get other people that specialize in assessment of pottery or objects like that. Uh, this turned out to be, for, from uh, in this case, part of what identified this ship was that it had something called Munz metal on it. I'd never even heard of Munz metal. But Munz metal was something used in the 19th century to, it was a kind of amalgam of metals that didn't rust, that was the important part, that, um, that they used in ship construction, and that, just finding that, I mean, Peter was able to date this ship on the basis of a brick from the galley, a nail, and the Munz metal. Because the shape of the nail, now this is something you and I wouldn't even know, but different kinds of nails, different shapes of nails were used at different periods of history. And so, and different kinds of bricks were used in the galleys where they had a fire going to cook the food. So they would lay down brick in order to keep it from getting to the wood. Well, the kind of brick that was made were made in different kinds of brick manufacturing places. And and the nature of the brick and the shape of the nail and then discovering a piece of Munz metal that was used to um, for the rigging of the sailing ship, on that basis he was able to say this ship could not date prior to a certain date, early 19th century. It had to come at a slightly later date in the 19th century because that was when they began to use this nail shape and they began to use Munz metal. And so that's the level of detail and it takes different kinds of experts to be able to make those assessments. Well, you did an analysis um, of the probability that you were able to find that brig, Leander, uh, which I thought was fascinating. If you figure... Well, let me actually read it because it's like a... Within consensus zone C, 65,849 sites of the same size as the ship could be placed, thus yielding a grid of 65,849 cells. If the probability of selecting this particular cell in the grid by chance exceeds P equals 0.05, then remote viewing can be considered the determinative factor. The probability of finding this one 5,000 square foot area out of the uh, square miles would be P equals point zero 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 nine. Pretty impressive. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's reasonable to say that you couldn't um, uh, you couldn't find it. Plus, of course, you also have to get then you get into all these little detailed objects that they describe. So it's not just the location part, but also the reconstruction. And then, uh, in addition to that, you can do, of course, the the correct, partially correct, incorrect, can't be evaluated. Uh, in this case, 4% of the information was considered incorrect. 83% was considered uh, uh, correct. So well, in, in addition to that, but then you can get down to how accurate each viewer was by concepts. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, that taught me how to put together teams of viewers. So if I was going to be doing a view of you as a human being, I'd be sure to put a couple of doctors into the remote viewing team because they would give me insights about you that a mechanic or a 
engineer or a physicist just wouldn't give you. Mm. And so by looking at these individual accuracy levels, not just on a single project, but over many projects, then I w that's why we were so successful, is because we had this minute level of detail of analysis, I was able to put together teams of remote viewers. They're not casually assembled. It's not just the first, you know, seven people that come through the door, but they're very carefully assembled based on their prior performance in certain concept areas. Mm. Well, I would think, or one might think, that after you presented this research and several other comparable projects, that the whole field of archaeology would be uh, pounding on the doors of every remote viewer they could find to begin to widely apply remote viewing methodologies in archaeology. But I, I gather that hasn't happened yet, even after decades of this research being publicly known. Yes, that <laughs> that is the sad truth. It, def it, it doesn't fit the paradigm. And people are very chary of getting, uh, of becoming involved with anything that isn't in the paradigm. You know, Dan Kayan at Yale did a series of studies showing that for scientists, the most important thing is not accuracy, but group peer acceptance. That it's much more important that your peer group accept you and value you, that's the most important value. And that people, what he calls risk, that people are very risk adverse. They don't want to say things or to talk about things. I mean, you can look, for instance, at Barbara McClintock's, who won the Nobel Prize. Her early work on genetics was, um, nobody paid any attention to it. I mean, for years, decades. Because they couldn't, it didn't make any sense. It didn't fit into the paradigm. You can look at, for instance, in archaeology, the no humans before Clovis. Uh, the Clovis was a particular site where they found these particular kinds of of um, of uh, um, spear points and and knives, and it was thought that there were no humans before Clovis. We now know that isn't true. But for decades, if you talked about humans before Clovis, whether well, you were just a crank or a nut. So it's, it's difficult for people in science to become adventurous in a certain way. Mm. Uh, the, one of the reasons that I always worked with first-tier people, you know, my Eastern Harbor work, the side-scan sonar parallel project was done by uh, Harold Edgerton, who invented side-scan sonar and was the chairman of radio physics at MIT. My, um, the, the, the nautical archaeology work that was done in the Brig Leander project was done by Peter Throckmorton, one of the fathers of nautical archaeology. Um, so I always went to first-tier people. And the interesting thing is most, if you talk to parapsychologists in general, they'll tell you about being shunned by people at their university and, and how it threatens their tenure and that sort of thing. But I, I didn't, tenure was not, I wasn't concerned about that. And I only went to first tier people. And the reason I did that was I did a lot of research along the way about create the relationship between creativity spiritual epiphanies, and things like remote viewing, non-local task performance. And what I discovered is it was a very similar process resulting in a very similar personal experience and that people who are the, the, the first tier breakthrough leaders that, who have the insights that change the course of science, when you talk to them about how it happened, you know, uh, they tell you, oh, I had it in a dream, or I just had this vision of this thing. I mean, I could give you countless examples of this. Poincaré saying he has a vision as he goes across the street about his mathematical work, or 
Nikola, Nikola Tesla seeing the electric motor as he's walking across Central Park, or Einstein getting the theory of relativity while he's whiling away an afternoon in a canoe. First-tier people have these kinds of breakthrough experiences that are just like remote viewers. And so I always went to first-tier people, not second- or third-tier people, because I knew they would be receptive to what I was trying to talk about, and I never got turned down by anybody. I just, I, you know, I look back on it now. I imagine Harold Edgerton, one of the most famous scientists in the United States. I did not know him from Adam's house cat. I sent him a telex from Egypt saying, I'm doing this thing in the Eastern Harbor and I'm doing remote viewing. And I, I sent him about a four sentence explanation of remote viewing because I knew he wouldn't know anything about it. Would you please come over and do a parallel track um, using a side scan sonar? And he sent me back a telex the next day saying, if you'll buy me a first class ticket and if you can do it between these dates and these dates, I'm your man. So you were able to also uh, raise the money to pay for these people. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. That, yes, these are not... I think part of the reason that people don't take on these projects very much is that, first of all, they're very complicated. Second of all, they are, by definition, interdisciplinary. They require whole teams of people. And third, they're very expensive. I mean, they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, a million dollars. Um, and but, so you have to be able to to raise the kind of money to be able to do that. And it's not easy to do. I can appreciate that it's not easy to do, but it does strike me that as a business strategy, you're much better off raising sufficient funds to bring in the best people than to try to do anything like this on a low budget. Absolutely correct. That's why there were lots of times I was approached by, you know, people who would ask me to do a project. I mean, I've been approached by a number of archaeologists, but, you know, they always say, well, I, but I don't have any money. I can't really pay you anything. I mean, you know, these kinds of projects, a typical project, Sea View, for instance, the Sea View project took Well, depending on how you really calculate it, between three and four years. So, I mean, you just can't do it for free because, unless you're independently wealthy, which I was not. So th there's, you know, there's no way to do it. You, you have, I mean, I had, let's see, there were th 25 divers, there were 35 people on the sea view. And then there were five more people in the archives then there were 10 more people doing the analysis, so 35, 10, and 10, 45, 55. There were 55 people who were involved in this project. So you got to pay all these guys. Yeah. You, you can't ask them to work for free. I mean, I don't just, as a matter of principle, I don't do that. You have to, first of all, be able to get them on board. You have to know who they are. So it takes a lot of research to find out who are the right people to ask. I didn't know Peter Throckmorton. Turned out we were related, but I didn't know that. Um, I never met him. I contacted him because he was a specialist in Bahamian archaeology and because he was one of the founders of, of American nautical archaeology. So I just wrote him and said, you know, I'm doing this project and this is what I plan to do. And and I need to tell you that that may be a little controversial because I'm using remote viewing and blah, blah, blah. And, and are you interested? And uh, so I think part of the reason that stops more people from doing it is because it is complicated. It does require so many people from so many different institutions and, um, and because it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Stephen Schwartz, Stefan Schwartz, <laughs> I want to say your name properly. Uh, once again, this has been a very informative and enlightening discussion. I have to say that in my mind, it, it raises many questions. So I you know, hope that we can do several more interviews because I really have different areas I want to probe with you more deeply. But, but this has been, uh, very valuable, uh, for me and, uh, I, I'm sure there will be people watching it long after both you and I are gone, and I hope they pick up the torch and carry it. Thank you very much, Jeff. I agree with you. And you know, I, I think these series of interviews that you're doing are going to have enormous historical importance. You have interviewed most of the what was visionary scientists of consciousness research doing this series of, of interviews and and, um, you know, I have a whole other life as a historian and, and, um, I know that historians of, and philosophers of science 50 years from now are going to look back on this and want to know, you know, who these people were and what they thought. I mean, wouldn't you like to know what Newton, why Newton thought gravity and alchemy had some kind of very meaningful connection for him? I certainly would. And you can't get it because it was never recorded, so there's no way to find out. Be a good so project for remote viewers. Yeah, you're recording the kind of stuff that yeah. people like me 50 years from now who want to know, well, why did they do that? And how did they do that? <laughs> yeah. We'll be able yeah. to do it because that isn't what appears in scientific papers. You don't write this kind of stuff mm -hmm. in the papers themselves. You just deal with facts. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I'm hoping you'll be you know, willing to let me probe a little more deeply into the depths of your own mind, because uh, what you have accomplished in the field of parapsychology, to me, is uh, head and shoulders above anybody working in the applied area. And I think it'll be very important for people to understand, you know, what thoughts were going through your mind. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Always enjoy it. Thank you, Stefan.